Welcome everyone to this special session on celebrating 125 years of women's suffrage in New Zealand, women's representation in Parliament and efforts to make Parliaments friendly, family friendly. 125 years ago, New Zealand led the world in votes for women in national elections. Interestingly, the leaders of the suffrage movement were motivated by the obvious um, that women were indeed, did indeed have a right to political equality. They were also motivated by something more than that, that women's votes and through women's voters, they would bring a unique perspective to elections. And so the hope was through suffrage, women would have a concrete impact on policies and the way parliament would operate. In fact, the original suffrage leaders, there was a quite a connection with the temperance movement. They sought the vote as a means to limit the devastating effect of alcohol on women and children, which in turn had to do with domestic violence and, and poverty. So the vote was something that would lead to a real impact for women in terms of policy. We went through a series of step changes in New Zealand in terms of women's political participation. The, the vote came in 1893, but we had to wait close to about a century until there was full political participation for women. Women were allowed to run for parliament in 1919. The first woman elected to parliament was in 1933. And then the first woman cabinet minister was in 1947. I'm particularly pleased to have come up from Christchurch to facilitate this session because Christchurch played a major part in the suffrage movement. Kate Shepard, who was one of the leaders of the suffrage movement, uh, came from Christchurch once she had immigrated to New Zealand. And Elizabeth McComb was elected in Littleton and Mabel Howard in um, Christchurch East. The next steps, really, towards political participation came with a decision in 100 years after the original suffrage vote, a, a vote in New Zealand to switch voter systems from first past the post to a mixed member proportional system. We know from studies that the form of voting system has a real impact on the diversity of representation in Parliament. So MMP was expected to change the operation and the face of Parliament, to lead to greater fairness in terms of proportionality for all the parties, but more than this, to also bring more diversity <clears throat> into the House. So in a sense, to have the House of Representatives actually look like the population from which it was drawn. This is sometimes called descriptive representation. So there were great expectations for MMP, and particularly for the impact it would have on the representation of women in Parliament. As you can hopefully see, it did indeed have an impact. If you can see the, the last first past the post election up to the first MMP election, you can see it did indeed have an impact. Interestingly, in terms of where women have come into the House through MMP, again, this was not unexpected. Predominantly, women have come in through the party lists. And in fact, if you look at where women have been elected in our mixed member proportional system since it came into effect, women overall have made up about 40% of all list MPs have been women. You compare that to all electorate MPs, 
and only 26% of all electorate MPs have been women. So it really does demonstrate in, within our mixed system the difference between first past the post and a PR list system. Party list systems are known to be far better in terms of bringing diversity into the House. Another real expectation of more women coming into Parliament is that the boats would rise with the incoming tide. In particular, people were looking for more women also to make their way upwards into Cabinet, which is of course the powerhouse of our parliamentary system. Again, you can see the impact of MMP. Another boat that would rise has to do with the ultimate leadership. Prior to MMP, we had no women in the role of Prime Minister. Now, since MMP, we are in our third female Prime Minister. In fact, if you look at the time spent in Parliament post-MMP, a majority of that time, New Zealand has been led by a woman in the role of Prime Minister. So MMP has certainly made a difference. And to put it into perspective, when the Right Honourable Helen Clark was elected in 1981, she would have turned around to look, perhaps, at fellow women who had been in Parliament and had the role of um, MP. She would have had 16 women to look to. Because before, prior to 1981, only 16 New Zealand women had ever been elected to Parliament. Now, granted, um, quite often they had multiple terms, but in terms of representation in the House, women never hit double digits before Helen Clark had come into Parliament. So what you can see then is a really big change. But with an initial breakthrough and up to about where women are roughly on average about one third of the House, we have had an exceptional year last year where a record number of women were elected to Parliament, but roughly it's been around one third. And it's been staying rather static at that point. Similarly, what you can see in Cabinet as well, a rather static position for women in terms of being fully inside Cabinet. So why is that? Well, partly because you have to remember that MMP is a mixed system. And our mixed system actually has more electorate MPs than list MPs. Women predominantly come in through the list, and yet we've not, women have not made the same level of breakthrough on the electorate side for a whole lot of reasons, which perhaps we can discuss later in the session. So I go back now and think of what the original suffrage movement were seeking. It's more than just counting women in Parliament. It's looking for something more substantive than that. And the idea of bringing more women into Parliament is the hope is that you create a critical mass. That's a term that comes from nuclear physics. It's the quantity needed to start a chain reaction. So what is the chain reaction that women were hoping for from this greater representation? Well, I would say it's something what I would call substantive representation. It's acting for women and in the interests of women finding a parliament that is family friendly and certainly a work environment that is women friendly. Hopefully, also what you would see is a spill on effect outside of parliament and into the general population as well. Into the workforce. Equity around our country. So really what today in this session is about is 
What have we achieved? What needs still to be done? Where are the blockages? So from the suffrage movement through to, to, to today, the representation of women in parliament and leadership roles more generally, in parliament and outside, nationally and internationally, where are we in terms of the representation of women? Well, I could not have asked for a better panel to actually lead us through this discussion. We have, of course, the Right Honourable Trevor Mallard, who is the 30th Speaker of the House. And they often say a picture paints a thousand words, and if any of you Google Trevor, probably the picture that is most likely to come up <laughs> is him holding a baby sitting in, in his Speaker's chair. And so it's important as in the role of speaker because a lot of the things that we, we need to do, perhaps, to make <clears throat> parliament more family friendly are things that, of course, the speaker can take a lead on. Who better than to have the Right Honourable Helen Clark here to speak to us today? The first woman elected Prime Minister of New Zealand and she was in that role for three terms. The first woman to take the role of administrator of UNDP, and in that role, she advanced um, the, the, the welfare of women and girls, has long been an advocate for equality and sustainability. Very pleased as well to have Dr. Jill Greer who is the chief executive of the National Council of Women, an organization that was formed three years after the suffrage movement. Three, so this, in three years time, we'll be back here celebrating that anniversary as well. But what an impact Jill has had in her various roles, and certainly what an impact the National Council of Women has had for New Zealand. And lastly, we have a new MP, Kiritapu Allen, who is a Labour List MP elected last year. And she is one of seven parents with babies under the age of one in this parliament. And I think there are two more about to give birth. So, it, it is a real sea change, I think, in terms of when we talk about needing to be family friendly, there's a really good reason for that. Um, I'd also say that Kitty has a background in constitutional and commercial law and um, has a, a very interesting perspective and fresh eyes on Parliament. So the format for what comes next is each panelist will make some opening remarks. But really, this is your session. Um, we then throw the, the floor open for questions to lead the panel and to talk about any one of the areas of this topic that you want to explore. So I'll begin with the speaker. Uh, thank you, Therese. Uh, fellow delegates. I've had the advantage of being with this group for, uh, uh, for a couple of days now, so I won't sort of stand on ceremony or do a lot of formalities. Um, the, the, the first point that I'd make is that um, early childhood education uh, and uh, the way uh, young children are treated have been a passion of mine for a very long time. Um, I was the licensee of an early childhood centre 43 years ago uh, and spent quite a lot of time uh, when I was Minister of Education focusing uh, on that uh, because I think it's important for the children but it's also important for the families, especially for the mothers, uh, to have quality uh, arrangements uh, in that area. Uh, it took, I think, 75 years uh, after the uh, after woman got the vote until the first uh, mother had a baby uh, while a Member of Parliament, uh, Fethu Tirukatni Sullivan, 50 years ago now. Uh, but notwithstanding the fact that that was quite a long time ago, we 
uh, didn't make and haven't made the progress uh, that we should have, and I, that was exemplified by, for me by reading uh, of the experiences of Holly Walker, a Green uh, Member of Parliament uh, who had a child uh, when she was a Member of Parliament, and Holly was not well supported by her party colleagues, she wasn't well supported by the parliamentary system, and she wasn't well supported by her friends, and I would put myself uh, in that category, and that meant uh, that it was a very bad experience uh, for her. Uh, and that was, I think, learning about that for me um, reinforced the importance of making the place uh, family friendly. Uh, as indicated, uh, we're, we've got seven at the moment. I don't think we're going to get more than seven. I think that we're going to, there's going to be some dropping out from being under one as the other one's coming in. In fact, the numbers might uh, overall go down. But it is with that number of uh, young parents very important uh, that the place be family friendly. The, the babies in the chamber, I think, um, I mean, it's important for bonding, it's important for feeding, but I think there's probably more symbolism in that. There are messages to be taken from that uh, that are very important, but there have been practically some, uh, some big things uh, and some small things that have occurred. For me, probably the most important one has been uh, the approach that we've taken to leave of members with young children. Uh, and uh, just about all of our uh, uh, of the members who have children under one uh, have taken advantage of um, a more flexible leave arrangements which, uh, uh, which we are implementing for them. Effectively, they get proxy votes for the people who are um, who you know who come from different voting systems? We don't have a pairing system in New Zealand, but effectively, uh, they get proxy votes um, uh, after an application uh, to me, which has been liberally uh, approved and interpreted. The other useful big thing I think has been flexibility uh, to support caregivers travel. Um, it is it is very hard uh, to uh, move around the country. Uh, with a young child and to come to Parliament with a young child and uh, having some flexibility over and above uh, what is normally available uh, has been important and has made it easier uh, to, uh, to bring babies to Parliament and to, and to uh, have proper bonding, uh, which I think, is, uh, I think is important. There have been a lot of minor things, um, high chairs, um, access around this building for caregivers. We've sort of, you know, we've got rid of a number of our rules about where people are allowed to go uh, and not go. We've opened up the atrium, which is a really peaceful area. Uh, there's quite a lot of baby feeding uh, and baby playing uh, goes on in there. Uh, the ban on children in the swimming pool has been lifted, and we've now got to the point where we have um, occasionally baby sessions uh, in the swimming pool, which I think are really good fun. We're going to have a playground uh, out the front, although that is more about attracting families to come to Parliament uh, than being there for uh, the families of members of Parliament. So all of all of those are all of those of changes that have occurred recently. Um, they're sort of designed to give a message that we want our parliament to be really a house of representatives. And the fact that people are young, uh, the fact that people are, because we still haven't got our balances right, although Clark Gafford might be helping, uh, around uh, childcare, and we haven't got the, the gender balances right in that area, um, it's, it's mainly an issue uh, for women, it's mainly an issue for younger women, uh, and I think if we want a house that's really representative, uh, we've got to address those issues. Thank you. And feel free to sit at your place, right Honourable Helen Clark, or you can come up here. Yep. <coughs> Always easier to stand. Uh, Kia ora, talofa, malo alalei, whakalofa laha yatu, kia ora ana, ni sambula vanaka, and warm Pacific uh, greetings to all friends from across the South Pacific, Australia, and of, of course uh, Kiwi friends are here. 
so uh, Trevor's uh, talked a little bit about some of the practical changes that have been made to ensure that Parliament's more family friendly, ever more family friendly, as there seem to be ever more young children uh, around. And Therese has given a great uh, factual overview of, of where we've come from in New Zealand. And I'll probably you know, sort of come over both of those areas a, a little bit again. Because it's, you know, we're rightly proud in New Zealand of having been the first country in the world where women fought for and gained the right to vote, which was 125 years ago. But things did move very slowly after mm. that. And in my work in international development over the eight years I was in New York, um, often you know, women in developing countries would be saying, it's so slow, the progress we're making. And I'd say, don't be as slow as we were because it mm. took a long, long time. You know, 1893 and then 1933 before the first woman was elected. And remember for a number of the early women who were elected, they were the widow of or the daughter of, right? Yep. Elizabeth McCombs was the widow of. Uh, Fetu, of course, was a, a daughter of. Mabel was a mm. daughter of. Mm. Uh, so there was that sort of pattern, which is a bit more like the South Asian experience of the women who got to be prime ministers mm. and presidents. They were the widow of or yeah. the daughter of, um, uh, uh, generally, to, uh, to get there. So it did take a long time. And when I was elected in 1981, we were not double figures. There were eight of us. And it's actually not hard to remember the names of eight people. Mm. Uh, in 1981, there were four sitting members. There was Fetu, who was a legend. Um, there was Anne Herkus. There was uh, Mary Batchelor. And there was Marilyn Waring. Mm. And added to that group of four was me, Fran Wilde, uh, Ruth uh, Richardson, and Margaret Shields. And then the following election, Cathy O'Regan replaced uh, Marilyn. But these are very, very small numbers. We were under 10% of the mm. parliament. And I remember when Sir Robert Muldoon uh, made his valedictory speech leaving parliament and <coughs> other interviews, and when he was asked, what was the greatest change in your time in parliament? He said, all those women. Well, we weren't many. <laughs> but of course we were. Made a noise, I suppose. Uh, but as an example of the, the way things have changed, and, and actually I think the coming of growing numbers of women into Parliament also helped professionalise the work, because truly this, this was a bit of a boys club, if you go back to uh, even the early 80s. And part of the boys club atmosphere was, I used to say there were three forms of recreation around here. Uh, one exercised this muscle, <laughs> and that was in the billiards room, which is what you now see as the lovely grand hall. Mm. It had four billiards tables. And eventually, with, quote, all these women, like eight, they decided the women needed to have somewhere to socialise because we tended not to play billiards. And so in the corner, immediate corner of, of this end of the grand hall, there was a curtained area, and it had a few armchairs. And believe me, if you sat in there and listened to the conversation at the billiards table, you learnt quite a lot. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, I never mastered billiards. Uh, the other muscles, of course, were this one, which was the bar. And the bar was greatly patronised by men. And then there were the card schools, which exercised these muscles. Well, you know. That really didn't appeal to young women coming into Parliament. So it was very much a boys' club. And I think um, when Geoffrey Palmer became leader of the House and Deputy Prime Minister in 1984, he was determined to professionalise this Parliament. And uh, he also made very important changes to the, the sitting uh, programme through the year, which is vital to make it family friendly. So when I first came, actually, we were elected in November. Uh, we were sworn in and had the address and re we had the address and reply debate in April. So Parliament didn't meet between November and April. And then after a month, we were sent back to our electorates and we didn't come back till the last week in July for the budget. And then we sat until Christmas with a lot of midnight settings. Now, how can people with families deal with that? 
You know, well, the boys always had because they'd you know, come down to Wellington for the week and mum looked after the kids. Mm. But you had growing numbers of women. This was just not, not tenable at, at all. Uh, we also used to sit Friday mornings, which was awful. So we'd have three late nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday morning. Mm. So Jeffrey's changes in 1984 really made a, a big difference in mm. starting to adapt the institution. And I think it's probably back in those years that the first parliamentary early childhood centre opened as, as well, which was an important move, including for the staff to have uh, a facility on the, on the premises. Uh, so a lot has changed and, and for uh, the better. Uh, look, one of the issues will be, you know, what, you know why, why is it important? And I think it's useful to use that phrase that Hillary Clinton used, it's probably not original, but it bears repeating, and that is that you know, gender equality is the right thing to do, right? It's right to have gender equality, it is a human right, but it's also the smart thing to do, because institutions that don't look like their society are just not in touch. Mm. And a parliament which had you know, well under 10% women just wasn't in touch. Now, what I also learned in my years at UNDP was that there was a growing body of evidence that said that when women begin to get into parliaments at that critical mass level, the term that Therese used, you see issues come onto the public policy agenda which you never saw on that agenda before mm. because no one thought they were very important. Mm. And you can look at uh, around the world at parliaments with significant numbers of women members who have started to take up issues of support for single parents, which had never been dealt with before, uh, issues of domestic violence and, 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 and so on. And I think in, in our parliament, if you did any kind of comparison of, of the, the issues dealt with, you know, really over the last 30 or so years, as compared with that, you know, would we ever have been talking about paid parental leave under that old um, representation, of, of course not. Would we have been talking about the, the 20 hours free early childhood education, which Trevor um, uh, brought forward as uh, Minister of Education and, and the government that I led? So things do change when institutions look more like uh, the mm. society. And that's not to say, by the way, that every woman is a great uh, champion for women. And it's definitely not saying that men aren't great champions. We've had great champions. Trevor is, is, is one of them and always, always has been. Uh, but the important thing is women have a right to be represented equally and actually you will get changes in the institutions of, of parliaments and you will get changes, I think, in the kinds of issues which are deemed to be important and will come to uh, the top of the, uh, the policy agenda. Uh, just a, a quick comment on supplementing what Therese said about the effect of the electoral system, uh, first past the post is the hardest system anywhere in the world for women to break through in. Why is that? Uh, because the image has always been of a man with a wife and a family. And that's what you know, those of us who were crashing through had to crash through, and it still hasn't happened much in a lot of societies which cling to that uh, form of political representation. Whereas once you get lists, parties are under pressure to make their representation more diverse. There's not much point going out and appealing for women's votes if you don't think it's important enough to have women well represented on lists. Or indeed, members of other sections of the community, uh, whether it is indigenous people uh, in our society, uh, also Pacific people are a significant uh, sized minority, LGBTI community, uh, and so on. You know, our parliament today looks much more like our society, which is a, a very, very uh, good thing. So in summary, I think at 38.7%, I think women's representation is at now, you know, 50% is within grasp. It needs another heave or two probably. Uh, but if the political parties pay it attention and start looking at the construction of their lists, uh, it can be done. Uh, several years ago, I uh, launched a very good publication, UNDP did, looking at uh, practical ways of boosting women's participation in, in parliaments. And it was actually pitched mainly at the political parties mm. because it said political parties 
which are the vehicles through which most of us enter a, a parliament uh, in a democracy, they can be the greatest champions of gender equality or the greatest <laughs> opponents. So let's convert them to being champions because that's the way you're going to see the significant lift in representation. Thank you. Kia ora tato. I'd like to acknowledge the people of the land and whose place we meet today and the journeys that you have all made from your places across the Pacific for this mahi today. It's a great pleasure and thank you for inviting me, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to go back briefly uh, to where we began, but yes, to say firstly, no, I'm not a parliamentarian, but I did try unsuccessfully. So I have a little understanding of the challenges of the people that are here who are parliamentarians and those of you who work with them and considerable admiration as well. So, 125 years ago, just down the road from here, this sign was displayed on a Wellington house. And it read, Notice to electioneering women. Electioneering women are requested not to call here. They are recommended to go home, to look after their children, cook their husband's dinners, empty the slops, and generally, attend to the domestic affairs for which nature designed them. By taking this advice, they will gain the respect of all right-minded people, an end not to be attained by unsexing themselves and meddling in masculine concerns <laughs> of which they are profoundly ignorant. So 125 years ago, and at the same time, here in this very building, Another parliamentarian was speaking and he said, it cannot be questioned that all women, physically, and to a large extent mentally, are not fit to be recipients of voting power equal to men. How much of that remains as unconscious bias and the stereotypes and gender norms, I wonder, across our countries? And another, Wirumu Peri, gave a warning to us all. I am afraid that if ladies were allowed seats in this house, it would distract the attention of some honourable members. <laughs> if attractive ladies are allowed to come into this house, I'm quite certain my own wife will never consent to my returning here. <laughs> and what does that say about the psychology, as it was assumed to be, of men at that time? So as you've heard, I'm from the National Council of Women. Most of you will have National Councils of Women across the Pacific, some of whom I've met when I was ex Chief Executive of Volunteer Service Abroad. And it was a pleasure to meet some of you at that time. And we are members of ICW. And in fact, today in New Zealand and the Cook Islands delegation, side by side, presenting their reports from their countries and from NGOs uh, to CEDAW in Geneva. And I was on a call at two o'clock this morning with them. So we do work together and we have much to learn from each other. When I was with IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, for five years as Director General, we worked in 170 countries. One of their rules was that to be a member association, and some of you will know this, of IPPF, half the board had to be women and 25% had to be under 20. Why? To help women understand governance because they knew what a difference that would make, and secondly, to encourage young people. And I want to pick up on that for a moment. In the last four years since returning home, I speak every year to 200 young corporate women, young New Zealand women, talented, able, wanting to be leaders, wanting to do work that is values-based. Mm. And every year, and the preceding one, with a similar group in London, I have said to them, would you work for an NGO? One or two hands go up. Would you go on the board of an NGO, learn about governance? A few hands go up. Would you go into Parliament? Not a single hand goes up. So this year, a few weeks ago, I thought in Auckland, this time will be different. Woman Prime Minister, having a baby, fewer barriers, thanks to the work of the Speaker and others, ministers who are women. It'll be different this time. Would you want to be a member of Parliament? Not a single hand went up. So we need to ask ourselves, as the speaker's just suggested, what are some of the barriers? 
what are the things that do <coughs> prevent women from taking part? Well, many of you will know the IPU and, and its research well. So one survey, for example, they conducted a few years ago said the main barrier for women were domestic responsibilities. The main barrier for men internationally were not being well enough known in the electorate. Mm -hmm. Interesting difference. The second barrier for women, in terms of major barriers, was for them um, the attitudes of women more generally in society. So if I go back to a survey that we did at the end of last year, the first gender attitude survey done in New Zealand with Research New Zealand, 20% of New Zealanders still believe it is more important for men to be in leadership positions than it is for women. Other countries might be interested in following that survey and seeing what your findings are, because that's what the second barrier clearly is for women. And for men, the second barrier was uh, lack of experience in public speaking, which is quite different again. And what about preparation? We've talked about how do you get people ready for this? How do we help women? And there's a number of things that are being done, but I would say, firstly, encourage them into local government. Here in New Zealand, there are very few young women in local government because the conditions are very, very challenging indeed for them. And of course, the more young women you will get in Parliament, and the more young men, the more young people you will get voting. And if we are to make sure that democracy continues to thrive, that has to be really important as well. We need those voters, we need that engagement and that interest. Until recently, of course, it was very much assumed that men would be the members of Parliament and the members of local bodies, local councils, and the women would stay home and look after the children. And some of that has been driven by unconscious bias, which I've already referred to, but some of it is conscious. And we talk about, can we break the glass ceiling? And I always say, but can we break the glass walls? We've actually got to get women across into the places where they can move up. But let's take the research in relation to business. Research here in New Zealand last year showed that 49% of 500 businesses said the reason they didn't have women leaders in their um, organizations in their businesses was lack of talent in the sector, the organization, and in women. Now that to me is clearly not the case. Very few of them had gender parity policies or plans, but it indicates how much we have to do. The research tells us that companies with women are more likely to have a better return on capital, assets, and sales, less likely to have staff turnover, greater loyalty, more inclusive and better decision-making, a completely different culture. If that's true for business, surely it's true for parliament as well, for government. And that's what we need to follow. So you've already identified and previous speakers have talked about some of the things that can be changed. I tried to sit up last night and write, what would a job description for a woman MP look like? Would anyone ever apply? Would anyone ever apply, in fact, for any job description? And similarly for men. If it's family friendly, it's about family in all its forms, as the UN would say, including rainbow families, diversity of families. It's about support for men. It's about encouraging men. New Zealand men, 1% take parental leave. Encouraging men to take parental leave so that they can take leave from the house as well. So. More work, as we're seeing, as needs to be done. But without a doubt, I think we can be certain that these same conversations, that we know, as we know, are happening not only in your countries, but in Canada, in Latin America, Argentina, Chile, Spain, all over the world. And I think you have the opportunity to go away from here and make some decisions that shows that, once again, the Pacific way can be the way to do it. Kia ora tata. Thank you. I would love to be able to give the whole range of Pacific greetings that the Right Honourable Helen Clark did, but unfortunately um, I'm not multilingual enough to do so. But I do want to extend my warm greetings to all of those of you that have travelled from throughout the Pacific 
uh, our um, neighbours in Australia and others to attend this, this conference. And uh, thank you, the Right Honourable uh, Trevor Mallard, our most fantastic speaker for two, providing the opportunity. Um, my name's Kitty Allen. I'm one of the younger, uh, newer MPs uh, that came in the 52nd Parliament in September 2017. And when I was thinking over the last few days, <laughs> what contribution could I possibly make when I stand next to, uh, sit next to some of the giants uh, beside me? And to put things in context, I was born on the second to last day of 1983. That was a couple of months before uh, the Right Honourable uh, uh, Trevor Mallard was sworn in as a first-term MP when he was about 31. And it was just after, uh, it was about three years after uh, the Right Honourable Helen Clark had entered into this. This, uh, this here institution. So I thought, oh goodness me, what possibly could I contribute? I guess, I guess where I probably landed is that um, in many ways I am the absolute beneficiary and recipient of 125 years of the work of many, many, many giants that have gone before me. Um, I look to women, women through a whole range of immense movements prior to uh, 1893 worked together to earn the right to vote. They fought that battle hard and won. And as has been mentioned before, it wasn't until 1933 that we had our first Member of Parliament. In fact, women couldn't stand for Parliament until 1919. The first Māori Member of Parliament, woman Member of Parliament, entered into this House in 1949. Both Elizabeth McCombs, who came in in 1933, and Irika Ratna, who came in in 1949, both came in off the backs of the deaths of their husbands. Mm, that's right. It was a long fought path just to be seen in this place. For me, um, I, I'm, when I grew up, I don't know whether I even knew that this could be a tenable pathway for me. Because it wasn't until 1997, my party, the Labour Party, is a hundred year, we're just over a hundred years old. And it wasn't until 1997 that we elected our first ever woman leader, who sits beside us today. That was quite a formative time in the life of I, and I know many of my colleagues, and actually I do want to acknowledge my colleagues, um, Maya Lubeck, Anna Hila, uh, Joe Hayes, Louisa Wall, and um, there may be some other colleagues of ours that sit at the back of this house. But it was through, in my lifetime, at the very least, we had few, but we had strong bastions. Dr Jill Greer, who has dedicated her lifetime uh, for women's, towards women equality. And we also had strong bastions like our allies, Trevor Mallard, who fought when he was an, uh, as a Minister of Education for things like, for example, 20 hours of free early childhood training. So there, there were pockets and efforts building. But now, um, when I came in, <laughs> I came in and look, it wasn't 50-50 and we do certainly have work to, do, to go. But there was a whole range of us Young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Uh, some of us with children in tow. If you hear one crying, that's mine up the back. There was, it felt like I was really, and we felt this collectively. We felt like that we had, um, we truly were the beneficiaries of so much work that had gone on before us. And I, I want to speak to some of the modern changes, I think, that have probably enabled young mums like myself to be able to come into this place and feel like it's a place that we can bring our children. Um, one of the fun things, I'll start with the fun thing first because it's my daughter's favourite. My daughter is Hiwi Tarangi. She was three weeks old when I came into Parliament. Um, the speaker, one of the first things he'd done just before we came in was uh, enabled families to use some of the uh, recreational facilities here, which wasn't possible to do prior. He mentioned the, um, that we have uh, baby caucuses uh, in the parliamentary pool. Sounds silly, but it's actually pretty cool, and it's kind of a bonding thing that we do, and that can be members from across the, each side of the house. Doesn't matter what parties we come from. You know, if we've got kids, we're in the we're in the pool splashing about. Um, something else, I think. Look, and it was it did. Um, there, 
there was a lot of attention given to uh, Trevor at some point, sitting with two babies in his, uh, in his chair in, the, in chambers. Uh, being able to, in those first few months, this is when baby really, uh, you know, we were new parents. Um, baby needed to be by us a lot. Um, being able to take baby in and out of a change at that time for us uh, was very, very important and useful. Look, it's not very helpful at the moment. She's 10 months old and she makes far too much noise and um, it's more of a distraction than anything else, much to uh, uh, the speaker's uh, displeasure. But in those initial months, and particularly before... Not, not the distraction, I like the distraction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the displeasure, <laughs> I think. better than most of the noise in there. Look, we, we, yeah. he said that uh, he was more uh, responsible and, and, and makes far more greater contribution than some of us, I think. Um, but look... The, um, the fact that we could just have that time and be able and flexible to bring our children in the house, uh, we sit up the back sometimes and just let them nurse and, and little things like that. Um, in those initial uh, months for us at the very least, it was very, very helpful and I know that that was the same uh, sentiment shared by some of my colleagues. But I too, I just want to acknowledge some of the, um, the challenges and the areas that I think that we have to uh, make some, well, I, I just think sometimes we don't really talk about the challenges because we're in an era at the moment where it's really important to speak to women's ability to do it all. But the practicality is, is that there is some real challenges with being a young parent um, operating as a parliamentarian. M many of you all know we, we travel a lot um, and we work very long hours in, this, uh, in, in, in chambers here. In 2014, uh, there was an amendment to the travel uh, rules for spouses, which effectively meant that um, spouses who, or it wasn't even just spouses, it could be a nominated person to that point, but you could have somebody travel with you as a member of parliament uh, pretty much freely. In 2014, that was amended to be spouses only and only when you were accompanying your, uh, uh, your parliamentary spouse on parliamentary business. For us as new parents, that was a real, um, that was very challenging because the allocation is 20 trips per year. Uh, that meant essentially it's about one uh, there and back trip from our uh, domestic residence, which is away to Wellington, uh, per sitting. That meant that we had to spend a lot of time apart in those initial months. So I'm not. I did look into the rationale for why the rules were changed and sometimes <laughs> I didn't really understand them myself. <laughs> I'll put a letter to the speaker. But those types of limitations and because sometimes they sound politically quite good to get tough on, you know, uh, entitlements for MPs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, some of the practicalities about being a new member of parliament with, ch uh, sorry, with young children, um, things like the ability to travel with your family, particularly in those first months, um, that, that's, been a, that's been a real challenge for some of us. Uh, and the, the second part was that, is it that the person now has to be a spouse. Um, and I know that that meant you couldn't travel with a caregiver. So that's also been quite a restrictive factor up until very, very recently. So look, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, we've come so far. I want to thank all of those people that have come before us and for making the movements that they have some have moved mountains, some have moved millimetres, some have moved inches. Um, but we truly are in a different time. Whoever would have thought that um, just 125 years ago, you would have, a, 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 well actually I hope they would have thought, I hope that they would have thought that this parliament would have been filled uh, with colourful young men and women from all walks of life. And I think that our parliament is working towards that point. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, now the floor is open to you to ask questions and to generate a bit of a discussion between our panel panelists. We'll ask the panelists to stay seated for this and please by all means jump in and have a freewheeling discussion. Does anyone have a question they would wish to put to the panelists? Thank you. Uh, this morning, and over the last couple of days, we've heard a lot about family-friendly changes to sitting hours to accommodate those arrangements. So my first question is, trying to find that balance between being a family-friendly parliament and making those adjustments, 
but also making sure that you manage the business, the house, and that the bills get through. Mm. I'd be interested in your view about how you've managed that or what ideas you have about mm -hmm. making sure that both of those things can happen. And my second question goes to some of the changes that you've already made here, and we've listened to some of those from Kiri as well. I'm just wondering, are there any other things that you are considering doing in this parliament sure. that would further advance the opportunities for it to be family friendly? Okay. Well, I, I might try and run those two questions together because I think there's a, there's a bit of what we could do which would, which would help a lot get business through. There, there, are, there are a couple of things which I've wanted to do that I have not been able to do. Uh, because I haven't been able to get the support of our business committee, which is uh, where, where uh, you get cross-party support uh, for changes. The first is a really simple one, uh, and that is that I think that when there is a caregiver wants to bring a baby to its parent, then the caregiver should be allowed to come to Parliament, not be treated as a, mm. as a stranger. At the moment, the baby is like a parcel, and the baby has to go. The mess our messengers are lovely, but having to give a baby to a messenger to give it to when, it, when it's in need of nursing uh, and, and have it handed on, I think is unnecessary and unsettling and shouldn't have to happen. There's, a, there's another area where I've, and where I've been knocked back, and that is getting some flexibility at the end of the week for travel, not for just people who have babies, but possibly for everybody or certainly those who have you know, families at home. Uh, we've got a regional airline, which is, you know, I'm not going to enter in, into the criticism <laughs> of it because it's a, quite a political thing here at the moment, but it has been pretty bad as far as regional flights are concerned. And so we have members for that in the uh, Northland, Tauranga, Gisborne, uh, yeah, Wanganui, Invercargill, and I'll use the Invercargill example, where for missing a plane by about half an hour after an hour after Parliament sitting, you know, they, they can't get it, um, they have to fly to Dunedin and they get a three-hour taxi to go to Invercargill, which gets them home after midnight and very tired, and, they've, you know, and then they get on with their work as an MP on the Friday. My view is uh, we've got a pretty good proxy system. How about just being a bit more flexible at the end of the day on a Thursday and let, and let, some, let some people who it makes a big difference to get away? But again, that hasn't been, that hasn't been supported. Um, as far as getting the business through, um, I, I think we can use our part, use our system of running uh, either the committee stages or non-controversial bills while our select committees are sitting much, much more than we do. We already do it, we have extended sittings and, and we do it maybe once a fortnight. There's no reason why we couldn't do it a lot more and have a lot of the technical and non-controversial stuff go through at that time and therefore use that as a method for, for shortening up. But I would, if I was going, that, you know, that would be to the government's advantage to do that, but what would be to the government's disadvantage, and I think should be the trade-off, and that should be that urgency should be for emergencies only, rather than just the government's not properly organised today and therefore will take some urgency to get something that they should have planned for better. So I think if we did a trade-off to let the government get some stuff more through, more stuff through and not have urgency, I think that, that could help a lot. That would also make the place much more predictable for families because you'd know when it was going to finish and it wouldn't suddenly um, uh, come back the next day. I think, I think long term we've got to look at, at what the Europeans do uh, under their list system, they have substitutions. You know, they have, they have someone can go on leave for a period of time, actually most often to be a minister, and then come back as a member of parliament, and they have, they have someone else on the list takes their role as an MP. And I think we need to, I mean, big electoral act changes and a lot of debate for that to happen, but I think that could help make the place a lot more family friendly. Mm. Yeah, from my experience, I think Trevor's making some really useful suggestions because the truth is we don't have a lot of sitting time for the volume of legislation that we have. So if it were freed up so that Parliament could get on with routine stuff on, say, a Wednesday and Thursday morning while committees are sitting, I think that would be uh, quite, a, quite a useful innovation. And as you say, Trevor, the, the trade-off would be there'd be less urgency. 
uh, because you'd be making use of those, you know, three to four hours uh, on those, those mornings, which, you know, most people aren't, a lot of people aren't on select committees at that time. Right. And, uh, and they're here. And they're here, so it, it would be a, a good use of their time. Mm. Could I just possibly add something as well. Um, from the outside, which is, I think it's critically important to do the business, we need the policies and the laws that will drive diversity and inclusion and result in true gender equality and equal opportunity for all. Secondly, I think there is a role, which is what you're discussing, yeah. which is very much about then how does Parliament itself implement the laws it passes, the well-being, for example, that is intended next year with the Living Standards Framework. And thirdly, I believe Parliament has a critical role to walk the talk, because mm -hmm. until it walks the talk, we will not see uh, the private sector, increasingly we are seeing the public sector, but we won't see this happen. So mm -hmm. to me, it's absolutely how do you get that mix of those three major responsibilities. Kitty, what would make the biggest difference for you as a mother of a young child. Yeah, look, I've spoken a little bit earlier around um, some of the travel um, limitations with your small family unit, particularly in those initial first six months. Uh, and I, 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 the other, probably most substantive change, I'm not sure, Trevor, just give me a glare if you want me to stop talking about it. But um, there has been some amendments made to the way in which compassionate leave has been granted to parents who are, who are parents of uh, children under six months and under 12 months. Those amendments essentially allowed for, particularly when the, the child was in its first six months, that there was a, a high degree of flexibility to when compassionate leave would be granted. And post six months to 12 months, uh, again, quite a level of, of flexibility. And what compassionate leave is for us, I'm, should be, I'm sure it might be similar across um, most houses, but effectively it doesn't go towards your numbers uh, in the house. So for me, one of my other jobs is I'm one of the party's junior whips, so I've always got to make sure we've got the right amount of people who can, and granting leave is a, is a challenge. So what compassionate leave enabled us to do, particularly for those new younger parent, uh, parents of younger children, it enabled those parents to be able to respond to the children in those times which are quite high need, initial six months and up to that 12 months. But it also enabled the body of the parliament to be able to continue with the, uh, with the work that we needed to do. I didn't get a glare, so mm -hmm. I continued. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, John Ajaka, President of the New South Wales Legislative Council. Uh, thank you very much for what's been said. Uh, the question I'm asking is in relation to a parent's room. Uh, recently, we reopened a parent's room at the New South Wales Parliament that had moved from a very small space that clearly wasn't affected to a room that is divided into three separate rooms. One for babies, in particular to sleep, one for toddlers who can, in a sense, run around and uh, watch TV, do whatever, and one for the parents to be able to sit at a desk, use a computer and continue to work if they want to. We've noticed that's had a very big impact for our members who are new mothers with babies, but also a, a big impact on their partners, being able to come to Parliament with them and assist and be able to use. I'm just, we're now looking at and examining whether we in fact hire uh, a daycare worker in that parent's room during parliamentary sitting days on a full-time basis, so that, that is one form of, I'm just wondering if anything like that occurs here or if you would feel that would make a difference. Well, I, I'm going I'm to toss over to Kirit Hapa in a second, but when I came, we had a wives room. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, there was a, a big change and it became a spouse's room and it's now a family room and, and and is used for those purposes. But I understand, and I'm not over the top of it, that, that there have been one or two other places. Uh, I think a speaker I'm not meant to know about it that might have been co-opted uh, by members, spaces that have been co-opted by members and are used for those purposes. <laughs> that, that may be true, Trevor. Um, yeah, look, I think there's a couple of interesting points there. We don't have a separated room in the way that you've spoken about, but we do have a room just by chambers that allows members to come in and out. Uh, and particularly in the first few months of that child's life when you're nursing a lot, uh, that was, it's, it's heavily used by uh, families. 
Um, the second thing is, and there's been discussions uh, amongst members with younger children, because of our sitting hours, because of the fact that we travel into Wellington and are out, our primary base is external, so we have our primary childcare, for example, out uh, in our various regions, but you can't kind of pop in and out of child uh, of childcare facilities, so it's actually very hard for members to get care for children on a temporary basis. So that's been a a very recent topic of conversation of some um, gusto, and I, I, I do wonder whether we, we, there might be a time when we do get together um, a, a, and, and consider petitioning the speaker about being able to engage somebody on, on precinct. I don't know whether we're quite there yet, but from my personal ex uh, perspective as a parent, it'd be immeasurably helpful. Mm. Hold it close. Good morning. My name is Kezi Pirik from the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly. Um, my question is probably to the three New Zealand panellists, uh, the women, that is. Uh, sorry, Speaker. Um, I hear all the information about, you know, making the parliament a friendlier place, a better place for families, young families, young mothers, young fathers, for example. But what about outside of the parliament? What work is New Zealand, the Council for Women or the New Zealand Parliament or any other agency for that matter, either thinking about legislation or making other workplaces uh, fam family friendly like the boss of your a bank over here who may be a woman or a woman who's in charge of a government department are they also being encouraged to have family friendly workplaces there's been for uh, many many years an equal opportunities trust that has uh, pushed this a lot uh, to have um, well, family-friendly, people-friendly uh, workplaces. And over my years as PM, I often used to go to the annual awards and, and, uh, and hand out uh, the prizes. So I got to see a lot of um, employers come across the, the stage, and they were in the public sector, they were in the private sector, and, you know, workplaces like the Navy or whatever. And, and these were workplaces that the Trust uh, worked with to uh, re really improve the way in which they supported people in the family context. Because when you employ someone, you have to know this is a, a living, breathing human being has a family context around them. And they do have needs. And there has to be some flexibility and some give and take. The bigger ones, of course, uh, can do the early childhood centre on the, on the premises. But they, they, they all need policies uh, which uh, mm -hmm. You know, a, a permissive of of parents having to take mm. time for the sick child, the 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 the, the appointment with the school, uh, whatever. So that's had had quite a quite a push. But uh, Jill will undoubtedly more be more up to date, and maybe Kerry, Tapu, and 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 Trevor about what happens these days. But it, it's been left pretty voluntary, I think. But there are good examples out there for others to build on and live and learn from. Yes, just to say that of those 500 organisations that were uh, surveyed by Deloitte's for Westpac, the major factor cited by women that would make a difference would be good preschool education on site. And we did really well in New Zealand in that, and the eight, you wouldn't remember, in the 80s probably, and it really is time for another push in that direction. It does make a phenomenal difference. So the university, for example, has six different uh, creche and kahanga reo here in Wellington for staff and for students. And I think it's some of those you know, institutions can make a real difference. Kitty, do you have anything? Uh, not so much. Yeah, okay. I've covered it off. <laughs> Andrew Young from the Victorian Parliament. I wanted to follow up on the point made about um, travel policies and ability to travel with partners, etc., or carers, which I think is a really good one. And that leads onto a question about the role of media. And um, because I think, certainly from an Australian perspective, the great fear, of course, is that as soon as you go into that territory, yep. you'll get a very negative response from media. There'll be a front page talking about snouts and troughs. Mm. And so I wondered if you could uh, talk to the experience of the media in New, Z New Zealand 
and uh, the extent to which they've been engaged in um, uh, your progress within the parliamentary environment with women's participation and uh, how you think that could be managed because I, I think in Australia that would be the first thing that comes to members' minds about why they don't want to go into that territory. If I could uh, make a comment, I mean, there's always been a media constituency for cutting back on members' conditions of service, right? Uh, and, you know, sometimes you wonder whether there'd be some expectation that you'd work for nothing at all. Mm. And the problem is when you can't start sort of cutting back on conditions of services and, and, and letting uh, salaries uh, erode, that's when you, you know, open the way really for corruption if, if people, you know, aren't... Um, Aren't, aren't properly paid, uh, you know, sad but true. Um, but I think uh, on the travel, uh, probably the fact that our new Prime Minister has a baby uh, and her partner's going to need to travel no, with that baby. Um, no, you know, I'm, I'm uh, sort is, of... Isn't that... Go no, I mean, no. I mean, that, there that, are rights, but the, yeah. the point is no one would want to question a partner travelling with a child to bring them to Parliament, right? That's right. Mm. E except, except that mm. we, after Helen, there was another regime, mm. and yeah. and mm. and I, I, mean, I don't want to get into highly political stuff, but I think it's fair to say that the that the family wealth meant mm. that um, what members of parliament received were not as important uh, to the former prime minister as they were to the vast majority of members of parliament. Mm. And what that meant was that there was a lot of tightening up, yeah. and that included the travel of, well, it included tightening of the definition of who could travel with a member of parliament, uh, and it had a restriction in the number of trips that that person could do, uh, back down to 20 individual trips for an ordinary member of parliament and 30 for a minister, although the, the, the prime minister's um, uh, spouse is, is unlimited. Um, so, you know, it is, it is very tight. Um, there's, there's a question about whether members of parliament want to go there because it's, it's, it's actually tightened up by legislation now. Previously, it was an area for speaker's direction. That's now, it's now been legislated so that it'd have to be an act of parliament, select committees, and whether people want, want to go there. The, the, one, the one, I think, good thing that happened was that we went from having sort of scandals and stuff always being in the paper mm. to doing, we now do quarterly reporting on total travel. Mm. So everyone's travel broken up by, you know, what you've got for driving on the surface, what accommodation you've got on Wellington paid for, what accommodation you have out of Wellington paid for, and your airfares are, within each of those groups, totaled up and published every three months. And for the first Two or three times it was published. It was, you know, it was really interesting news, and I think it's probably about two years since I've seen any comment that's flowed from it at all. Apart from, I think, apart from one minister um, who um, who didn't understand how internal affairs uh, in New Zealand basically uh, quintuple the cost uh, of a driver in a car because they do overheads on overheads on overheads uh, through a very bureaucratic system and people get charged. I, I don't use a Crown car to go home at Wainuiama, to Wainuiamata at night. It costs me about 65 bucks in a taxi. Uh, when it's a Crown car, it's 350 just uh, building on Trevor's point, though, I think there's, there's an equity point to be made. So our Prime Minister with the young baby, her spouse, I now learn, has unlimited travel. But, you know, what about a young mother who's not a minister, obviously not the Prime Minister, uh, whose spouse is very restricted on travel? You know, that, so there are yeah. equity issues, yeah. and, and those need to be thought about. I mean, whether there's the political appetite to tackle them, I don't know. Probably only if the babies were well represented across all parties would it, would it perhaps uh, open it up to be revisited. But prima facie, it, it isn't right. Sure. 
From the point of view of someone who's been an employer of, of quite a large, you know, a few hundred <laughs> volunteers and, and a staff of around 70, one of my questions would be, how would the 2015 Health and Safety Act apply to Parliament and those working in Parliament as parliamentarians and as staff? And I would think there would be a number of challenges that, that would need to be addressed that would perhaps mm. provide rationale, but I'm sure mm. greater minds than mine have thought of that already. Mm. I think that you've really hit the nail on the head. The fact that there is, I mean, the discussion's going to be perpetuated by the media, right? And that's the, that influences the way in which public uh, opinion will swing. Uh, I feel like there is definitely, I, mean, I, I don't know that there'd be the political will to increase, you know, members' uh, travel allowances after they were cut in, cut back in 2014 and that's a real issue because it means that we effectively you know you inherit this you, you inherit the environment that we've got mm. which was without getting political a lot less family focused and friendly just a few years ago than it was under mm. uh, the previous uh, uh, under the uh, administration of uh, the right honorable Helen Clark and it is under this current government now too so that's the issue it's political um, we can't do a lot about it but uh, I think that, you know, we must at least state that there is an equitable issue. Well, yeah, yes, it is. It's an equitable issue, and it's one that we probably just have to turn our heads and nod to unless there's a real uh, turn and tide of public opinion in terms of letting members of parliament have, uh, get perks, but I, I can't see that happening. Can, can, I, can I just wait, make one other point and, and, and say, and you know, I'm, I'm going to be trying to say this really carefully, but we've got a long way to go on gender equality as far as the roles of parents is, is concerned. Yeah. And, and still, the majority of young parents um, in the parliament um, are males. Yeah. And, um, and they're not they're not their baby, you know, they're, they're, not, the, they're not the primary caregivers. And until we get um, more, you know, more young woman MPs, mm. you know, who, who want to travel with their babies, mm. um, I think we're not going to get the pressure. I mean, it, it's it, it, we've got some we've got some attitudinal things mm. about who looks after babies mm. yeah. uh, to be considered pretty carefully yeah. um, uh, in order to develop the case. Uh, for change, and it almost, you know, sometimes it seems like to me as a, you know, as a, you know, as a, a, a as a parent of the early 70s, actually our attitudes generally in society haven't changed that much since that time, and we need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the proportion of, of of those who take parental leave who are fathers is pretty small, oh, right? Is yeah. it 10%? If less. that, probably less. Uh, so that makes your point, I think. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And it's chicken and egg, isn't it? You won't get the young women who are mothers who want to travel with their babies while the barriers exist as they are. Yep. So mm. it is chicken and egg in many ways, yeah. I, yeah. I think. I mean, certainly if we know that domestic responsibilities is the major barrier, mm. if I think of four years of my very informal survey of a couple of hundred women, very able, very committed, very passionate about all sorts of things, they don't want to enter Parliament. Mm. We have a question over here. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sheree Morris-Tafatu, the clerk of uh, the new <laughs> Legislative uh, Assembly. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge all the great women and the great men who are here today, because I believe that, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, both genders do uh, contribute towards the development of any country. Now, um, it seems to me that parliaments uh, over a long period of, of time, they have become very inclusive. Now, uh, the question that I would like to pose to the fellow uh, my Pacific Islanders, because I do believe that, um, I mean, like you, Dr. Jill, I ran for parliament last year in May. Unfortunately, I was also unsuccessful. So I was trying to figure out why is it that, you know, the women, they weren't like um, are supporting women in getting into parliament. But then one of the reasons why they told me it's because you're doing such a great job in education, you didn't, 
want you to leave. I said, but that's not a very good uh, rationale for not um, <clears throat> you know, uh, voting for me. However, um, in, you know, in the Pacific countries, we have this challenge in relation to our culture. Now, our culture by way of uh, our cr being Christians, that it is a, a woman's place to be in the kitchen, raising children, and so forth. Now, in asking um, some of the speakers and, and clerks uh, from various Pacific Island countries, how do you face the challenge of such a perceived notion that that is where a woman's place is? And like, uh, I don't know, most probably uh, in the next round, I may run also for parliament in Niue. But firstly, I'd like to ask from you, parliamentarians or um, uh, speakers or clerks from the region in the Pacific, how do you face this challenge uh, that is before us? Thank you. You know, it's not a, a challenge unique to mm. Pacific Island countries, right? I mean, to get women established as a viable political force in New Zealand, we had to put non-traditional roles behind us as well. And this was a pretty, pretty traditional place. Mm. If you go back uh, to the 40s, when women married, they had to resign from the public service. Now, we had the period of World War II, uh, 39 to 45, and a lot of men went and served overseas. Mm -hmm. So the women then, oh, please come out of your home and come and do the jobs the men aren't here to do. When they came back, women were expected to go home. Yeah. Right? So that, that's the kind of New Zealand that I was brought into. I did not, uh, I didn't know when I was a child very many women who worked at all, right? They weren't in the paid workforce. And interestingly, I, my father's two sisters both kept working. One was a teacher and one yeah. uh, ran a, um, a grocery store with her husband. This was very unusual. Yeah. Uh, generally, women were at home. So when you stepped forward, you know, as a baby boomer to yeah. say, you know, you're running for parliament, uh, this this did take some breaking through, and I remember all the prejudices uh, from back in that 80, 81 period when I was first running. You know, the people who said, oh, she'll never go well at the bowling club in the RSA, and this is a, this is a working man's seat, they said. Well, you know, the working men had daughters and wives and mothers, mm -hmm. many of whom also voted, but, you know, th these were the perceptions that you had to break through. So... Uh, the, the, the Pacific Island countries have among the worst representation levels of women in the world in their parliaments, fact, mm. right? Last Papua New Guinea election elected no women. Mm. Mm. I think the height was three in the previous parliament. Uh, sometimes Dame Carol Kidu was the sole woman elected. It's tough. But I just have to urge the women to keep going and to build, to build alliances of women and men who will support them because your parliaments are the poorer for not having the women's voices. And, you know, often we hear, oh, you know, the women are powerful, but it's behind the scenes. Well, why should they have to be behind the scenes? Why aren't they at the top table helping make the decisions and shape the, yeah. the policy agenda? We can't accept that our role is to be behind the scenes. Uh, I never did. Uh, and nor, I think, should anybody else. Can I just comment there, firstly, from a personal point of view, my mother-in-law would not let me work once I had children. I was a teacher, so I gave up teaching. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my husband decided that we would move firstly to Hamilton and then to Wellington without any discussion at all mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. that's how much agency, if you like, I had. That said, change is possible and for the suffragettes they were helped by men yeah. just as the speaker and other male colleagues in the house mm. are supporting women parliamentarians mm. on some of these moves around flexibility and secondly mm. i've worked as with as has helen with um parliamentarians groups of women parliamentarians both in uganda and rwanda both of whom were outstanding, and I had larger groups attend meetings that I was there for than anywhere else in the world. They were paid less because they came in as if they were on the list, but what a difference they made. Mm. And so that quota system, and I know it's not a popular notion, uh, but it has driven change, and that change is reflected in policy mm. and in the economy of those countries as well. Mm. So those are a couple of thoughts in relation to that. Uh, I also too want to make a brief comment because there's been a whole 
broad range of amendments as well by very, um, I guess, coordinated and organised groups of women from a range of different organisations. For example, within our party, we had a range of constitutional amendments that might not have been like publicly that popular, but actually really resulted in the 2017 list process that came through. We had a, uh, well actually, our, our constitutional requirement was to seek a target of 50% caucus comprised of women. And as um, Dr. Therese uh, examined before, a majority of our members of parliament come in in New Zealand on our, uh, women members of parliament, come in on our parliamentary list. So that list process became very important to have uh, diverse or uh, have uh, woman representation here in Parliament. So there was, for a very long period and sustained period of time, there were people, I guess you could say party activists or people within our party that really had that focus of trying to see an equitable gender balance and so forced it to happen uh, through that constitutional amendment process. And so we've got quite a clear target which really was reflected, for example, on that last list. So I guess if I, my comment is that change occurs through a whole range of ways and finding a whole different range of ways to influence the, the ultimate outcome, I think, is really important in terms of just a movement for I, more representation. I, I'm, I'm going to make a brief comment here, which might end up with me being thrown out of the old boys club. Um, the, we, did, we did an analysis in the 1980s that looked at the 1981, the 1984 and the 1987 elections uh, back in the days of first past the post which showed that the swing for women candidates who were uh, Labour candidates was better than for the men. You know, sometimes we were going in one direction, sometimes we were going in the other, but the, but the women had better results and we, we did a bit of thinking about that and the point that we got to was that the women were better. The women actually found it harder to get selections, and once they had got selections, they ended up being better candidates and better members of parliament than the men were. Mm. That's exactly right. We have one more question here. Thank you. Um, my name is Daisy Alec Momotaro. I'm a member of uh, the parliament from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Just want to comment that I, I was very inspired of all, all the four speakers. But I think it's a very good opportunity for me to thank the um, uh, women of New Zealand, the uh, Council of Women, because you know we, the women of the Marshall Islands, before I became a member of the parliament, I used to be an advocate group for the Umbrella NGO Women's Group in the Marshall Islands. And it, it was through the friendship of the, um, our NGO women's group and the uh, Council of Women in New Zealand that they funded us for four years. Mm -hmm. And during those four years, they really built the capacity of our women mm -hmm. to, have the, um, to be confident in running for the uh, local government and the, also um, our parliament. And I want to thank, you know, it was um, Unifin Women of New Zealand and the graduate women's group that funded us for executive four years and we, had, we were able to bring male partners from all over the Marshall Islands and build our partnership. And from that time on, we were able to, when we ran, you know, the mindset of the men and even women also, they would change. And it, as you can, as you may know, um, we are out of 30, 33 members of the parliament, we have three women. <laughs> Two of them is the head of state, her Excellency and Madam President Hilda Siaini, and the other woman is the, uh, she's a member of a cabinet, and myself, I'm the senator. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna thank and I wanna encourage all the other Pacific women sisters, don't be discouraged. As we can, we heard the stories. It's a long way, but we'll be good in the parliament. And I'm seeing that I have so many, all the males in my uh, members of the parliament, you know, they've been very helpful. I also chair the uh, committee for the um, judicial and uh, governmental relations, along with eight men. And they're very cooperative with me whenever I need their help. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope you will agree with me in, in my assessment that this has been a really worthwhile session. 
I've been listening to our fantastic panel and the really insightful questions from the audience as well. And I keep, the, the question in my mind that keeps coming through is if Kate Shepard, who, was, who led the, the suffrage movement in New Zealand, if she were here today and if she looked at New Zealand and at its parliament, what would she think? And I think there are certain things that she would be really happy about. Um, particularly looking at the record number of women that we have in the current parliament in New Zealand. The fact that we have a prime minister who is not just a woman but is, is off on leave with her baby. Um, that her partner will be the primary caregiver of that child. Um, Kate Shepard would look at that and say, you know what, that's, that's probably, you know, what we had in mind. And the fact that over the last while since MMP, we have had three women in top roles in New Zealand as Prime Minister. I think she would be happy that Trevor is making these changes in Parliament mm. to make it more family friendly so that people mm. like Kitty can come in as an MP and not be separated from her child. Um, and, and I think um, Kate would have actually really liked the statement that Trevor made was that this is sending a message it's sending a message to New Zealand, to young people, that this is a parliament that wants to be representative. What would she be most depressed about? Well, two things, I think, in terms of what I've heard this, this morning from the panel. Um, Jill's comment that when she asked a young audience of intelligent, well-educated, women who are in a, you know, quite a, a, a high-rising career path, how many of them would be interested in running for Parliament? And not a one put up her hand. So that to me is, is slightly sad. And I wonder, it makes me wonder how much um, <laughs> We're doing a lot in Parliament to make it more family friendly, but the reality is, is that what most of the public sees is question time. Quite an adversarial, um, personally at times abusive, um, uh, and also you see our elected representatives also take quite a bit of a battering perhaps in the media. So there are certain things, obviously, that people look at and decide that actually this is not a friendly environment for me to get involved in. I think perhaps another thing would be, in the last week or so, we've had a very damaging report come from Dame Margaret Beasley about um, a, a culture that was not family friendly or woman friendly in terms of the private sector. And so I suppose the other thing, that, you know, the suffragettes were expecting was a spillover from Parliament as well into the broader society in terms of women-friendly workplaces, in terms of, of equity. And we've seen signs that that is not entirely there yet. So what's to be done? Well, the Right Honourable Helen Clark enc encourages us to aim for equity, political equity, not for women, gender equity, not just because it's the right thing to do, because, but because it is the smart thing to do. And she rightly says we need to think carefully, and parties, if they want to lift um, gender representation in the House, they need to think about how they construct their party lists. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt about that. And in fact, and to, to pick up Trevor's point, um, research shows that there's a noticeable symmetry between selection and election. If you talk about the barriers for equality for women to be represented in Parliament, it is really around getting access to winnable candidacies. That is the big hurdle. It's at the selection process rather than the election process. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage us to go beyond 
just thinking about where women are positioned on the list, because the fact of the matter is there are more electorate MPs in New Zealand than there are list MPs. And with each redistribution, that gap is getting bigger. So it's really important as well, and I would say specifically to national and labor, because the electorate seats are dominated by the two major parties, that it's really important as well that we look at selection in the electorate side of the house as well. Because the reality is, and I, I heard the, the session in, in when you were talking about some of the times you have perverse um, outcomes, unexpected outcomes, for example, of having accommodation in Parliament in Queenstown gave them the license to have sitting right. hours Queensland. to go till Queensland. 12 or it's not a nice Queensland, place. Queensland, um, to go um, to have late <laughs> sitting hours. Well, interestingly, in MMP, really the election outcome is decided by the, by the party vote, which has freed up people to actually separate their electorate vote. In other words, you can, your electorate vote is unlikely to really impact the overall result in Parliament. So what's happened is, is we have really high incumbency rates on the electorate side. Um, and so on the electorate side, if you want a sustainable um, career in Parliament, it tends to be by being an electorate MP. So the problem for women is if they're not making the breakthrough on the electorate side, and part of it is because there's long incumbency rates, but instead coming in through the list, turnover on the list, churn, churn on the list is, very, is much quicker than it is on the electorate side. So until women are as successful on the electorate side as they are on the list side, um, it's going to be hard to really forge those sustainable political careers in Parliament. So lots to talk about, and um, I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking Trevor Mallard, Helen Clark, Jill Greer, and Kiri, Kiri, Kiri Allen as um, our panel today, and thank you for your insights. Thank you. Um, my job just to be the monitor again. Um, we're going from here into the Grand Hall. Uh, lunch uh, is the compliments of Commonwealth women uh, parliamentarians, uh, and um, we have um, some small gifts uh, for our uh, the convener of our panel uh, and our panelists. Thank you all very much. Thank you,